I presume you're here in order to learn of Magecraft. I'll have you know, there's no room for the weak-willed in this course. And despite your best efforts, the sorcery of our time is but a fraction of what it once was in the Age of Gods. Much of the craft is established through pedigree, and the culture of mages is riddled with deception and moral depravity. That said, if you insist, I shall do my best to educate you in this miserable, yet fascinating world. Today I shall speak of the foundations of Magecraft, also called Thaumaturgy. In essence, Magecraft is the reenactment of mystery, performed by mortal man. Mystery, in broad strokes, refers to the supernatural, exceptions to the workings of our planet Earth. To become master over nature is to derive power from a source that supersedes nature. In other words, to access the root. The swirl of the root is known by many names. Akasha, the vortex of Radix, even heaven to an extent, though technically it can have no name. It is an empty space beyond the world in time, a metaphysical locale from which all existence comes and ultimately returns to. Our very souls emerge from the root as concepts given form or origins. We call such things mysteries precisely because we lack a firm grasp on their nature. Why do we exist? Just what is life? Do we have a purpose? These ontological inquiries have plagued us since our inception, and mages look to the root for answers. It is aptly named Akasha for the Akashic Records, an archive of the world's nearly infinite possibilities. There was once a time when the world flourished with magical energy, or mana. Some mages were hailed as magicians, able to channel energy directly from the root with ease, enacting miracles. This Age of Gods is named precisely because of its gods, beings of divinity granted life through human worship. Various creatures, phantasmals, roamed the earth in abundance, and yet such times are no more. The Age of Gods declined as man began to rely more upon science, which admittedly has its merits, but wound up leaving these mysterious beings with no choice but to abandon our realm the world, for a separate space, the reverse side of the world. Since then, mankind's greatest legends exist only as such, mere legends, stories that are nigh impossible to verify. Yet, mages continue to recreate these miracles and have almost universally made it their goal to establish a connection with the root once more. Magecraft, then, is only the mimicry of miracles, a far cry from the true magic of those who managed to reach the root and live to speak of it. This is the greatest achievement for a mage, to seek the swirl of the root and obtain true magic. In other words, to transcend from magus to magician. In all of human history, only five mages have successfully done so. They are truly magnificent, using their acquired magics to master the human experience. In an academic sense, it encourages mages to continue their pursuit, and yet, they all struggle under the same exact dilemma. The very will of our own planet wishes to keep us from the root. This is a function of the deterrent force, otherwise known as the counterforce. Possessing true magic allows for one to, if inclined, drastically threaten the Earth and its inhabitants on a global scale. To prevent this, the planet's will manifests in two forms, Gaia and Elia. Gaia prioritizes the survival of the Earth itself, whereas Elia is a unique derivative, prioritizing humans as an important part of the Earth. The system is not without its flaws, however, as the pursuits of humanity are occasionally at odds with the well-being of the Earth. With trends throughout history, such as the decline of the Age of Gods, Gaia and Elia have diverged and will occasionally conflict with one another. The question remains, just what does the counterforce look like? Because of its nature, mages find it hard to identify. It is, for the most part, intangible, 
a force which acts to manipulate the world by passively steering humans away from danger, like the hands of fate. As such, it can be difficult to determine if and how it will react in various situations. But nonetheless, mages find themselves failing to reach the root without a scheme or power strong enough to overcome it. Of course, the counterforce also intervenes in worldwide threats by employing agents who pledge themselves to it. These are counter guardians, but their relevance will be addressed in another lecture. Noteworthy examples of mages trying to thwart the counterforce include Sorin Araya and the Einsburns. Araya was a Buddhist monk who preserved his mortality for 300 years. By witnessing countless deaths, he developed a sense for perceiving people's origins. Combining this knowledge with practical studies at the clock tower, Araya devised a method of bypassing the counterforce that involved the rarity known as Ryogi Shiki. Her origin, nothingness, maintains a constant connection to the root itself. Araya wished to use her and her mystic eyes of death perception to trace this connection to the root. To distract the counterforce, he caused conflict between Shiki and other descendants of demon hunters, while also constructing the Ogawa apartment complex, an architectural feat invoking yin and yang, sheltering the repeated deaths of its inhabitants. Even with all this preparation, he still failed, as the counterforce operated through Shiki to slay him. The very phenomena we call the Holy Grail War was originally designed as a means of bypassing the counterforce. At its core was a complex spell infused with homunculi called the Greater Grail, which granted mages the ability to summon heroic spirits, a feature intended to be used only by the counterforce. By using the counterforce's own heroic spirit system against itself, mages would summon powerful familiars who, when defeated, would return to the pure mana that comprised them. This mana would be siphoned into a vessel, the Lesser Grail. The Einsburns planned to use this tremendous stockpile of mana to form a direct path to the root. This concludes our lesson for today. In summation, all things that exist come from and will eventually return to the root. Magecraft has steadily declined on Earth since its inception and mages of the modern era seek the answers to life's deepest questions. At the core of our universe, mages seek the Root's power to transcend their magecraft and obtain true magic. This ambition is at odds with the planet's own will to protect itself and the humans who reside on it. Thus, very few mages have ever succeeded in obtaining true magic, with their attempts to reach the Root becoming more and more elaborate. In my next lecture, we will go over the known true magics and their wielders, which I hope will serve to demonstrate precisely why ordinary mages covet the root so ambitiously. Until then, class is dismissed. You are welcome to ask me pertinent questions if you so choose, but do bear in mind that we still have much to cover. Hey everyone! This has been a sneak peek at my Lessons in Magecraft series that will, from now on, be exclusive to patrons and channel supporters. If you want access to future lessons, please visit Patreon or click the Join button here on YouTube. The minimum pledge is $1 per month, though of course I'll be grateful for whatever support you can offer. Thanks for watching! If you enjoy this channel, help me beat the algorithm by liking, commenting, and sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell as if it were your waifu. That way you'll never miss out on all of my anime content, lore videos, live streams, and Holy Waifu Wars polls. My vids are struggling to get featured, so that bell is absolutely critical. If you want to support me directly, check out my Patreon, or consider donating via Super Chat. And as always, celebrate your fandom!